Hey, everybody. Paul Gray here. Thanks for joining me for another edition of Grace to All. In the last few weeks, I've been talking to you about living as sons and daughters, praying as sons and daughters. Today, I'm going to talk about thinking as sons and daughters of God in the kingdom of God. Actually, I really want to introduce you to a concept that's different than thinking. Thinking is done on a temporal level as influenced by our five senses. And actually, we have a lot more than just five senses. Being aware, however, is a totally different thing. Being aware takes place in our spirit or what sometimes was called in the Bible times our heart, our spirit, the eternal and unseen realm, which is infinitely different than our mind. It's like a sixth sense where we actually partake of the divine nature, where we know and experience and live oneness, one with the God, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Now, where do we worry? Not in our spirit, in our minds. Our minds where we worry not in our spirit, where we are one with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> First Corinthians 6, 17, the Apostle Paul says, <clears throat> this most translations say, in our union with Christ, we are one spirit with the Lord. Actually, most translations don't say that. <clears throat> That's the mirror translation. In our union with Christ, we are one spirit with the Lord. Most older translations say, he who joins himself to the Lord. Well, neither the word he nor joins himself to are in the early manuscripts that we have. <clears throat> we don't do the joining of ourselves to the Lord. <clears throat> he created us, joined to him, one spirit with him. And again, we don't worry <clears throat> in our spirit, which is one spirit with Christ. The mind is where the battle is and where we need to be aware that the victory has already taken place by Jesus. Apostle Paul also writes in Galatians chapter 5 that he calls it the flesh here. The flesh is the same thing for the ego or our mind. And he said the flesh is always at enmity or at war with the spirit. And to live and follow after the spirit, our spirit, who's one with the Holy Spirit, instead of what our mind tells us to do. Our mind wants to be in charge, wants to be in control. I'm going to read a wonderful passage for you from uh, a book called The Greatest Secret. My wife, Kitsy, has been reading this. She shared it with me, and, and I want to share it with you guys. <laughs> Ask yourself, am I aware? Am I aware? Don't try to answer the question with your mind. Thoughts cannot help you experience awareness. Each time you ask the question, am I aware, your attention will be taken away from thinking in the mind and will be put on awareness. When you ask, am I aware, awareness is present instantly. The mind may come in quickly and have a thought, but if it does, simply ask the question again, am I aware? The more you ask the question, the longer you will remain as awareness, and the quieter your thoughts in your mind will become. After asking, am I aware? The first thing this author says you'll likely feel is a sense of relief, as any resistance you're holding in the mind and body starts to melt away. After repeatedly asking the question, over time, the feeling of relief will turn into a subtle feeling of peaceful happiness. You may feel a sense of serenity as your mind becomes quiet. You may feel currents of joy running through the area around your heart. You know, it's interesting. The fruit of the spirit is love and all its many expressions, joy and peace, and then the others. When the fruit of the spirit is not worry and angst and, and fear and stuff. So, I, I uh, agree with that statement. Actually, I agree with most all of this. <clears throat> the relief that you feel, the author says, is due to your mind falling into the background. 
The longer the mind remains in the background with awareness presence in the foreground, present in the foreground, the greater the relief and the more happiness or joy you'll begin to feel. Bliss comes when awareness remains permanently in the foreground and the mind is delegated to its rightful place. The author says, remember, awareness is formless. So it's not something you can hold on to. It's like love. You know love exists, but can you hold on to it? You can feel the sensations of love in your heart, but you can't grasp it in your hand. It's the same with awareness. You will feel the sensations of relief and happiness in your body from awareness, but you can't grasp it or hold on to it. It can seem difficult to consciously stay as awareness in the beginning because of our habit of thinking all the time. <laughs> as soon as this is noticed, we may ask again, am I aware? In this way, we invite the mind away from the objects of knowledge or experience towards its essence, towards the source with a capital S. The way to break the habit of incessant thinking is by being the infinite awareness that you are. You can't use the mind to stop the mind and break the habit of thinking. That's the reason why many people fail at meditation, because they're trying to use the mind to quiet the mind instead of allowing the thoughts to come and go without giving them any attention. For most people, there's virtually no relief from their mind because it's constantly throwing up one thought after another, and they don't realize they can remove their attention from their thoughts. Freedom from the mind is such a glorious relief, and it comes when you can observe thoughts rather than being lured into following them and believing them. And of course, Jesus says, take no thought, no thought that's disturbing. Another way of saying being aware is to constantly know and trust and experience union with the Holy Spirit. Union. The mind will fight that <laughs> because it wants to be in control. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25 and, 20, and 45 through 45. It, this is subtitled, Don't Worry. He says, this is why I tell you to never be worried about your life. For all that you need will be provided, such as food and water and clothing, everything your body needs. Isn't there more to your life than just a meal? Isn't your body more than clothing? Consider the birds. Do you think they worry about their existence? They don't plant or reap or store up food, yet your heavenly father provides them each with food. Aren't you much more valuable to your father than they? So which one of you, by worrying, could add anything to your life? And why would you worry about your clothing? Look at all the beautiful flowers of the field. They don't work or toil. And yet not even Solomon in all his splendor was robed in beauty like one of these. So if God has clothed the meadow with hay, which is here for such a short time and then dried up and burned, won't he provide for you clothes you need? Oh, you of little faith. So then verse 31, Jesus says, forsake your worries. Why would you say, what do we eat or what do we drink or what do we wear? That's what the unbelievers chase after. Doesn't your heavenly father already know the things your body requires? By the way, the word unbelievers is the Greek word ethnos, which actually means a multitude of individuals of the same nature or genus, the entire human family. Now, verse 33, this is the climax of this passage and what I want to talk about today. So above all, constantly seek, Jesus said, God's kingdom and his righteousness. Don't seek to try to become righteous. You already are. Constantly seek God's kingdom and being aware of his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Refuse to worry about tomorrow, but deal with each challenge that comes your day one at a time. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Seek to be aware. I went through that. Well, I go through this a lot, but last week, I, uh, last two weeks, one each week, I had cataract surgery, first on my right eye and then my left eye. And I, I wanted to have it done so I could see, see a lot better. My sight had become really cloudy, but I was cloudy. I was a little apprehension, a little apprehensive about the surgery and that kind of stuff. And I just felt the Lord saying to me both weeks, Paul, I got this. 
your worrying about it or thinking about it, what it will be like, is not going to make any difference at all. It's not doing you any good. It's harming you. It's harming your thoughts. So let it go. Live it. Give it to me. So I did. And immediately, the fear and the bad thoughts go away. Now, they can come back, but immediately, I can give them back to him. So with this verse, seek first the kingdom of God. Again, we don't seek to become righteous. We've been talking a lot, I have with you all, about how we are already righteous with God. This is all throughout scripture, especially what Paul writes. We have already been made right with God because he made us right with him before the foundation of the world, and nothing we can ever do can change that. So Jesus is saying, seek to know and remember that you are righteous. Be aware of your righteousness. Experience it. Experience, we experience our righteousness apart from our mind. Our mind's liable to say, you're not righteous. Look at what you did here or there or whatever. Or your mind's liable to say, well, maybe you can be righteous if you work and hard and do this and do that. Or sometimes when we do things right for a while, our mind can say, look at you. You made yourself righteous. See, all of those are lies. <laughs> They're lies. All right. Being aware as sons and daughters in the kingdom. Where is the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus said, it's in you. And he said that to unbelievers. The kingdom of God is in everyone. God is omnipresent, everywhere present. How could it not be in us? Who is the king in the kingdom of God? Well, God is. God the Father is the king. Jesus is the king of kings. Who are you in the kingdom of God? Well, you are a son or daughter of the king. You are the brother of Jesus. You are friends with the Holy Spirit, Papa, and Jesus. You're partners with them. So how do sons and daughters in the kingdom think, or better yet, how are sons and daughters in the kingdom aware? How do we become aware? Well, we have the mind of Christ. Now, this can sound like mystical stuff that I got no idea what this guy's talking about. The Holy Spirit has to reveal this to you. It's not something you can learn or deduce by thinking. It has to be revealed to you in your spirit. And then you have to let go of your mind, fight what your mind says, be aware of what the spirit says to your spirit and take sides with the spirit, not your own mind. You have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ speaks to your spirit, not to your mind. The mind of Christ speaks to your spirit. And then your mind has the choice to be stubborn and want to be in control and say, no, I know better than God, or to relinquish and let the spirit, let the mind of Christ have sway over a thing. Uh, we talk sometimes in, in religious circles about the four O's of God. Actually, most time they only talk about threes, but there are four, and a fourth one is arguably the most important. God is the four O's. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. You could be all-powerful and use your power not for good. God is everywhere present, omnipresent. You could be everywhere present, but if you weren't good, people wouldn't want to be in your presence. God is omniscient. God knows everything. Well, <laughs> you can know everything, and if you knew and kept track of and thought about wrong things that people do, that wouldn't be good for us either. The fourth O and the other three, in my opinion, are not helpful unless you know this one. God is omnibenevolent, which means possessing perfect or unlimited goodness. Omnibenevolent God. If you believe that God is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, well, I tell you what, you better also believe the truth that God is omnibenevolent, or you will think that God's going to use those other things to get you. All right. Now, you Google that, and it says, people also ask, what does it mean when God is omnibenevolent? And the Oxford Dictionary says the term omnibenevolence means all loving. Get this. 
And Christians believe that God loves everyone unconditionally. Well, at some point in time, the editors of the Oxford Dictionary believe that Christians believe that God loves everyone unconditionally. <clears throat> I wonder how many religious people <clears throat> have read that. I was a, quote, Christian for a long time, <clears throat> and I certainly didn't love everybody unconditionally. I didn't love anybody unconditionally. When we are aware in the kingdom of God, our awareness is based on the underlying assumption that God is good to all, omnibenevolent. God is love. God is unconditional love for all people. God is all powerful. Therefore, God's power is only used for good and to love, never for evil or to punish. And God is everywhere present and knows everything and is continually working all things for the good. Being aware of those things will then affect how you think about God, yourself, others in every situation you're in. Your mind may say, oh, well, yeah, yeah, God is good and all that kind of stuff, but God is, is also, you know, God is also wrath and justice and holy and, and that stuff. Well, show me how wrath and your definition of justice and your definition of, of holy, show me how they are loving. You have to make stuff up to do that. You have to say, well, it, it's loving because God says it's loving. No, <laughs> no. Anytime I fall back into thinking, that God is demanding, full of wrath, impossible to please, list-keeping, punitive. Not only am I thinking lies about God, but I'm thinking wrong about myself and everybody else. See, I tend to become, and so does everybody, what we think about God. If we think, well, it's okay for God to punish his enemies, then obviously it's okay for us to punish our enemies. Proverbs 23, many Bible uh, students know this verse. As a person thinks so is he or she. Well, that's actually not correct. <clears throat> what is correct is, as a person thinks, so will they act, whether good or bad, appropriate or inappropriate. We are not what we think. We will act like what we think, but that's not who we are. Awareness will show us and remind us that who we are is who God says we are, right with him, one with him, perfect, without fault, all of those things. <clears throat> now, what you think about God, yourself, and other people does determine how you will act, what you will do, but you are not what you do. You are who God made you. We may do, and we all do, I do, we all may do things that are not good, that are harmful, that we regret, that we wish we wouldn't have done, but that's not who we are. If you think God is stingy and barely doles out scraps to his children, you will live a life of lack and worry and striving, maybe lying and cheating to get what you think you don't have. You will do things that are not helpful, but that's not who you are. That's why it's so important to be aware of who we are Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This, this is the passion or the uh, mirror translation. The survival and self-improvement programs of the religious systems of this world, including the Christian religious system, the survival and self-improvement programs of the religious systems of this world veil the minds of the unbelievers, exploiting their ignorance about their true origin and their redeemed innocence. The veil of unbelief obstructs a person's view and keeps them from seeing what the light of the gospel so clearly reveals. Let me ask you and myself this question. Compared to two years ago, has your thinking changed? Compared to five years ago, has your thinking changed? Ten years ago, you're thinking about who God is who you are and who everybody else is. You're thinking about the afterlife. Do you think your life is better now than it was two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago? Do you expect your life to ever change? Boy, I remember there's a point in my time when I thought, hey, this is the way I am. I, I can't change. It's, you know, you're, you're, you're not correct in asking me to change. 
and I didn't say that to God. It, said that to other people who wanted me to change, and I needed to change. <laughs> Here's what Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. I'm going to start out with the uh, <clears throat> Passion Translations, Philippians 4, 4 to 8. Be cheerful with joyous celebration in every season of life. Let your joy overflow, and let gentleness be seen in every relationship, for our Lord is ever near. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout the days. Another way of saying, be aware of your oneness. Offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell God every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart or your spirit and then your mind through Jesus Christ. Verse 8, keep your thoughts continually fixed on a group of things. Be aware. Now, I'm going to switch over to the mirror for Philippians 4.8. He says this. Now, let this be your conclusive reasoning. Be aware or consider that which is true about everyone as evidenced in Christ. Live overwhelmed about God's opinion of you. Not what your mind tells you, but God's opinion of you. Acquaint yourself with the revelation of righteousness. Realize God's likeness in you. Be aware. Make it your business to declare mankind's redeemed innocence. It's what I'm doing right now. Think friendship. Discover how famous everyone is in the light of the gospel. In the light of the gospel, mankind is in God's limelight. Be aware of that. Ponder how elevated you are in Christ. Be aware of that. Study stories that celebrate life. That which was hidden but is now uncovered. In Ephesians 3, 21, Paul speaks about the truth as it is embodied in Jesus. Be aware. The word overwhelmed there, <coughs> it means the gospel is the revelation of the righteousness of God. It declares how God succeeded to put mankind right with himself. It's about what God did right, not what Adam did wrong. So, Here's what I want to encourage you to do and myself. Be aware. Take time every day. Be still. Turn off all the devices. Get away from people. Be quiet. Be aware. Don't think about things. Don't try to reason about things. Don't let your monkey brain take you off on the worrying about what you're going to do next or why you're not doing something right now or whatever. Be quiet. Be aware. And then ask Jesus, Papa, Grace, what do you want me to be aware of? You will hear. Sometimes you'll hear a word or a phrase or more than that. Sometimes you'll get a, a sense of something because of music you hear or birds that you hear or flowers that you see or whatever. Whatever you hear, when you ask God, what do you want me to know? What do, you, what do you want me to be aware of? Write it down. Write it down in your journal. If you don't have a journal, get one. It can be just a notebook. Write it down. Write it. I write it on my hand in the morning so I can see it every day. You know, sometimes it'll just be aware that you're one with me. So I just write one down there. And then I just sit and think about that. Well, I, I, I ponder it and I'm aware of it. And I try to not let my thoughts take over just ponder and i'm just aware i'm one with you papa jesus grace i'm one with you show me what you want me to know about that what do you want me to say what do you want me to do and then just listen folks this is a, a different way of life than thinking and uh i hope this has been helpful to you it certainly has to me and i'll come back next time and we'll discuss some more things so, Thanks for being with me today for another edition of Grace to All with Paul Gray. See you all next time.